Hello, dear participants. I am Başak Akar Özer, and I'm joining you from Ankara, Turkey. I'm an assistant professor at Ankara Yıldırım Beyazıt University, Department of Political Science and Public Administration. I define myself as a nationalism scholar, but my research topics also include culture and biopolitics. I would like to thank Miri for the precious invitation uh, based on my uh, book review, which was published in Nationalities paper uh, last year. It's a great pleasure to moderate today's event. And I'm also thankful to Miri uh, for providing the opportunity to bring this lovely community together to talk about uh, Mr. Mirsat Kriyesora's uh, book today. Uh, Miri Minority Issues Research Institute is an independent non-partisan think tank headquartered in Bratislava, Slovakia, and it focuses on minority issues and promotes the rights of minorities worldwide. Miri fosters collaborations between scientists, researchers, practitioners, and minorities with diverse backgrounds uh, to contribute to an inclusive future. Uh, Bashak, we lost you. Can you hear me truly? Yes. Okay. Um, today we will be talking about Mirsat Kriyesorak's book called First Nationalism, Then Identity on Bosnian Muslim Snack Identity Understanding the Relationship Between Nationalism and Identity Through Native. European Muslim group. So in other words, we will be talking about, I think, a significant book on Bosnian Muslims who live in the USA and a book to contribute nationalism literature. With this book talk, I think it is no wrong to say that our focus will be on uh, the relationship between nationalism and identity, in particular through a specific case. Before passing the table to the author of First Nationalism and Then Identity, I would like to give a quick information about the book and its author, Mr. Kriestora. The book was published uh, by University of Michigan Press in 2022 with 330 pages. The book can be received either in paperback, just like I did, or as an ebook. Um, for a quick sum, I can say. The research investigates uh, whether nationalism comes first, then identity, or it is the other way around. So it is the main argument of the book. Although the book is mainly about nationalism and national identity and how it is constructed through uh, people's minds, it is an also an interesting work to present an example uh, of long distance nationalism with reference to Anderson. About, uh, to, to give a quick information about the author, I can say Mr. Kriestorak is a professor in Florida and also a senior researcher at MIRI. So he can provide firsthand accounts in the question of Bosnia and Bosnak identity. I believe this book, uh, this book talk will be highly beneficial to those who are interested in Balkans in general as well as nationalism scholars. So um, before giving the word to our author, I would like to inform our guests about some technical issues, how, like how uh, they can ask questions or how can they contribute with their comments and so forth. You can raise your hand by using the hand icon. Once we call upon you, please check your mic and then introduce yourself. Afterward, you're welcome to contribute with your questions. If you don't have a microphone, you can type your question and we can read it here on behalf of you. So um, I'm done here uh, as, as the introduction part. So thank you for listening to me. And now, Mr. Kriyasar at the table is yours. Well, thank you, Bashak. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for agreeing to be the host. Um, I was, uh, it was my pleasure that I actually read some of your work as well on nationalism. And uh, I liked it. Uh, uh, 
the work on theater nationalism that you did some times ago. And then I also was able to see you at ASN, your, conf your paper on, on bio-nationalism, on vaccine nationalism, and, uh, and see how you are moving forward with your research. And so thank you again for being with us to, to, to moderate this today's conversation. I'm happy that you actually read my book. So we can talk about it. Um, uh, so, you know, I was uh, essentially um, in, you know, looking into transitional regimes initially. I was uh, very much interested into transitional regimes, considering that I do come from former Yugoslavia and, you know, have experienced that whole, you know, transition from one re political regime into another. So it was a fascinating topic for me. And uh, as I was studying transition, transitional regimes, I realized that between um, some sort of uh, uh, systems that are in a way um, different than democracy into democracy, there is one in-between step, in-between step where the group has to form or reform itself to be able to actually effectively transition. And that in-between step is also a step where the groups are usually um, create a possibility for their collective action. And so uh, looking further into that, I realized that that step of in between, you know, just corresponds also with the emergence of democracy or democratic regimes as regimes within uh, European space and further is this, uh, the step of nationalism. So then, you know, it was um, after that, things went into that direction to investigate how nationalism works. And it was particularly that focus on, you know, creating ability or possibility for a group to have a collective action. And basis for collective action, as we uh, all know, is identity. So then uh, I realized that it is essentially that nationalism is primarily concerned about that, primarily concerned about, you know, um, creating, upgrading, however you want to call it, changing significantly identity uh, for the group uh, and then uh, um, and, and producing possibility for the next step. So that was essentially my guiding idea. And then, as you all know, literature on the nationalism talks frequently about nationalism mm -hmm. as if nationalism is driven by some sort of uh, as if nationalism is driven by a strong identity, but actually it's vice versa. It is, uh, as also well established, it is an elite driven process. And when elites have, uh, when elites need to somehow transform the group, they, um, uh, they use nationalism to do that. And then they produce uh, identity for the group that is uh, needed that is uh, uh, for for that phase of the group development. So that is also a new thing, I think, in my work. Most of the works on groups, and we use Brubaker's term on, on nationalism, he calls it groupism or, or groupness, right? So he considers uh, those previous entities as groups, not necessarily ethnic groups, national groups, or some just groups, and then nationalism is a form that increases groupness or decreases groupness, right? So um, uh, most of these works on groups essentially look into uh, uh, groups as a stable categories which don't change, which is also a problematic notion. I actually think that all groups change based on the experiences they go through. And so nationalism is one such um, experience. And so uh, that's why my uh, research, when I kind of came up with a model, with a question and with a hypothesis, I was looking for appropriate group to test my proposal. And that's where I looked into, I was considering essentially initially Eritrea because it's a fascinating, exceptional African story, but due to the, nature of the regime there where you know it's very hard to get data from from Eritrea I decided to focus on Bosnian Muslims and Bosniaks and understand the process and test my hypothesis with that group however and I'm suggesting that the group is essentially changing so it is an existing group well-established local 
Balkan group, which have been there for as long as any other group. However, the group is transforming itself into a new form. And I essentially propose that all local groups have changed. However, you know, that will be uh, probably contested by many. So I said, okay, let me kind of focus on one group, which clearly have changed the name of their identity. And so there will be much less contestation in terms of, you know, that initial proposal. And then again, uh, I was thinking, how do I approach that? Um, how do I approach that? And then I decided to do something that is also absent from the literature, study nationalism from below, uh, essentially look at the project of nationalism at the, um, at the uh, ground level, basically how the nationalism project the test that propos proposal that nationalism uh, uh, is comes before identity, nationalism serves as a, um, as a process to reform, change uh, identity. So I said, okay, in order to test that proposal, to that proposition, let's kind of test it with the group that nationalism is directed to. Um, as you all know, also when you listen to or, or read uh, works on these issues, the whole um, subdiscipline of nationalism is usually tied to that elite, elite, elite projects. Where they talk about elites and they talk about you know elite um, created goals, um, the elite desires, the elite projects, but the rarely nationalism is tested on the ground level among the ordinary people where actually it's supposed to produce what I suggest that it produces. Once it did that, then it was a matter of essentially gathering data from that ground level, which I have done by going around. I initially had a much larger, uh, how do you say, project in mind, but due to the uh, you know constraints in terms of time and money, right? I was able to collect data just from the diaspora groups in, uh, in the United States. However, I did travel some, you know, almost 10,000 miles to gather that data. And I visited centers where, um, where, uh, how you say, where, you know, Bosnian community lives in the large, um, uh, uh, they live in the large uh, groups so that they can actually maintain data. Yeah, I actually have a kind of nice, interesting screen. You know, this was my, my trip, right? This is how I collected my data. I traveled all these places and made all these stops so that I can um, uh, essentially gather data from the group. So, um, so I went, collected about 700 uh, um, uh, survey responses, survey, 100 survey, where I measure uh, that identity, change of identity based on the factors that I basically did by uh, examining the historical development of the group and what factors actually are the most important in that project of, of um, establishing or changing that group local group into a nation. And uh, the questions are constructed to measure that. Uh, once I gather th those uh, 670 valid uh, responses, survey responses, I organized them. I, since I had a different, how you say, measurement for each question, I had to homogenize Z-score, which basically means I brought all the answers to some sort of mean, and then I measured differences from that mean. We know from statistics that usually normal distribution is three standard deviation from the mean. So then I measured those, how many standard deviation each response is in a plus or minus direction. That was possible then to somehow construct the whole uh, um, uh, uh, regression that we did in the end to measure the identity. And, uh, you know, for that reason, that was somewhat uh, a, a limitation of the study. So for that reason, the differences between the factors or the differences among the groups, which I kind of created out of these 670 uh, uh, res valid responses, was not significant. Why? Because the differences between these standard deviations are very small. But nevertheless, in this type of study, which I have done, which is basically exploratory study, 
you know, it, it is significant to show that this direction, which I propose works. So uh, all these things is described in a book and uh, I hope, uh, you know, people find the time to read it and see, you know, how nationalism can actually be observed and measured in a scientifically rigorous way. Then finally, when I went to that group level, uh, I encountered uh, also, as I was coming up with the design, I understood that not everyone on that group level is the same. I realized that there will be some people who are identity promoters, or sometimes in literature they talk about them as ethnic entrepreneurs, and some people who are just receivers or other people who respond to these initiatives. So I decided to divide the data into those two sections, right? Um, then I realized also that literature, extensive literature on, on feminism that talks about also um, problematic assumption that these groups all respond the same way. And Brubaker talks about it also in a way of problematic assumption of the, of the uh, groupness across the group, that, that it is the same uh, strength. So I realized, okay, I should also pay attention to these differences between uh, uh, gender, right? So I have separated female and male. Beside those um, differences in terms of social status, then I realized that also they may be affected by different type of memories. So the, the data is divided into categories based on when people left Bosnia and what type of education they have received. And all in all, you know, um, in the end, we got a very good data set to make observations and to test proposal. Finally, to test the proposal, instead of using regular regression, um, I decided to use multinomial regression, which essentially tests the likelihood of respondents choosing one over the other, because we know that identity is rarely yes or no thing. It's never really one identity, right? That is usually most, most people have multiple identities and we consider identities to be a social categories, which people assume when they interact with others. So uh, contrary to very often misguided proposal that identity is something internal that people feel stuff, you know, people confuse identity with ego or identity with self. Identity is as again, well-established probably perhaps Goffman is the best one who talks about it, but Erickson and others, but they talk about identity as being a social category that people assume and then act upon it, and then they're being judged by it, or they judge the world around based on that, you know, social category, which we refer to as identity. And so I realized, okay, there will be multiple identities that people may want to have, and so the best way to test is to essentially test what's the likelihood that they will choose one over the other instead of, uh, um, instead of uh, how you call it, um, instead of selecting just one uh, identity, yes or no, right? Which normal regression will show. And so doing that in multinomial regression, we measure likelihood of adopting identity. And, you know, the regression showed that that relations between uh, nationalism and identity works. However, we, this is just the beginning of the story and we should look further. Now, finally, um, what I can say also is that during that process, you know, it was fascinating to also observe, and I write about that in the book, you know, how diaspora groups works, you know, and so I realized that some people talk about, you know, problematic um, aspect of the research and of the book that the, the whole thing is measured in the diaspora. But, you know, the literature on nationalism talks often about the fact that nationalism is the strongest or rather most strongly felt in a diaspora group. As some people argue, you know, diaspora is a nursery of nationalism. People tend to be more nationalistic in the diaspora than back home because, you know, it is easier to imagine community from distance than when you are there. And even Anderson have written about that long distance nationalism and how nationalism works also well in a diaspora groups. So yes, it will be much better if we if we could have compared this data with the groups in in uh, in Bosnia and Sanjak and the groups in 
in some other places, like I propose in, in the book I mentioned that ideally this could be tested by measuring the diaspora group in Turkey, Germany and Bosnia, right? Because each of these groups have, uh, uh, have established diaspora in the different times. In Turkey, it was all the way up to 50s, maybe late, uh, early 70s. Then Germany after that was essentially a prime diaspora location all the way into until 1990s when the war happened. And then after that, United States is essentially was a place where many Bosnians, Bosniaks went due to the war. And obviously measuring it in Bosnia will essentially give us much better, better overview of the whole story. But, you know, as I said, uh, this is perhaps something that may can happen in the future. And, uh, um, um, and as is, it is still uh, quite interesting. And so this is essentially what I would say about the book, right? Um, obviously, there is a significant part of the book deals with the Bosnian Muslims and Bosniaks as a, as a group under which uh, that was used to test the proposal. And their story is also well explained. Uh, so I, I have a pleasure to say that there is no, that that was actually the first book that talks about Bosnian nationalism um, ever written. And so uh, I was able to do so. And as I said, I was, um, instead of focusing on that elite uh, level of the group, I decided to measure what that identity means for the ordinary people who are actually supposed to be caring and acting upon that identity. And in that way, historically, empirically, and theoretically, I have basically observed that identity and understood it in a certain way. There are works that are coming about Bosnian identity. There are works that have been produced, uh, not necessarily much, but some works have been produced in Bosnian language. However, all of them are lacking that aspect, which is essentially testing it to see whether these proposals are actually whether the, the regular population, so-called regular population, responding to these proposals that are being uh, offered in all those works. So I, in, in, in a way, I, when I listen and I read about those other works, I am somewhat uh, always imagining a data that I have, which essentially shows, you know, what people consider to be important and what kind of factors they respond to. And there are lots of fascinating stories, right? Uh, since Bosnian Muslims or Bosniaks are, are one of those groups that were not well, uh, how do you say, emancipated during the communist period of Yugoslavia, even though overall we can say that the period in communist Yugoslavia for Bosnian Muslims were more positive than negative, but they were not able to fully emancipate themselves because due to the uh, nature of that country, how it was formed. It was formed as a kingdom of Serb, Slovak, uh, uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. It was not formed as a kingdom of Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia, but it was formed as a king, kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. That means other groups did not really have a chance to fully emancipate themselves and fulfill their, how you say, group and national um, intentions. And so for that reason, Bosnian Muslims and did not really have their national history. And so lots of things that Bosnian Muslims conceive today and perceive and interact in using their interactions with others are based on the memory. And that it was a fascinating thing for me as I was researching it, because among other things, I have asked the question about, um, you know, limitations or, or, of identity in terms of race, you know, who could be included into Bosnian identity I asked general population, and I was surprised to find that over 80% of respondents have said that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Bosnia could be of any race. So uh, I was wondering, how is that possible? And I was thinking that maybe that is the effect of the United States, where Bosnians interact in the in this type of, uh, how you say, neighborhoods, and, and they have... Uh, they, they, which are much more diverse in that way. But then, you know, in the conversation with some of the people I was consulting with, like, for example, Dr. Breslin, Thomas Breslin, he told me, no, if this is the factor, then 
the perception of identity will change among Italians and Irish who have been in America much longer, but it didn't. So then I looked deeper and I realized that it is essentially memory, which essentially feeds the notion of identity among Bosniaks, where, for example, I found that Bosniaks uh, have been living throughout the Ottoman Empire, literally throughout the whole Ottoman Empire, and they have formed their diaspora groups throughout that empire from all the way down uh, on the Horn of East Africa, like in the city of Masawa, there's still some people who have a last name Bosniak, right? Two, you know, very distant areas in in uh, in Asia where Bosniaks still live and they have been able to interact with native population back home. So these type of uh, memories and these type of factors actually travel through through the population um, consciousness throughout times, unlike the groups around them, unlike uh, Croats and Serbs who have been basically always, you know, interacting locally with their local setting in their local setting and maybe Central European settings, but Bosniaks have been having that um, uh, cosmopolitan, how you say, experience for, for the past 700 years. And so that was quite interesting aspect of my research when I looked into that group and uh, understanding how the group is evolving based on these memories, not based on the so-called official histories, which are usually involved in this process because you know, in the schools, they are being taught as official histories, right? Here we have a group which didn't have that. And uh, I actually make an argument in the book that Bosniaks learn nationalism from Serbs and Croats who actually have been teaching their official histories in those, you know, schools in the former Yugoslavia. And so they learn nationalism, but then they had to come up with their own response to it. And so it, as I said, all these things is well explained in the book. Finally, you know, I also looked into something that is not common, and I have to say that I also wrote an article now, hopefully it will come out, um, about, you know, particular approach to religion that Bosnian Muslims have to, to Islam. And we all know that Muslim groups are absent so far from full-fledged nationalisms. Um, they are yet to go through that process. Why? Because nationalism as a form of particularism is oftentimes um, uh, antithetical to, to universalism, universalism of, of religion. But for Muslims, this tension is different. Why? Because, uh, you know, Islam as a religion is general. It, it's universal it's in, in its message, but it's not universal in its application. Theologically, it is established that it could be applied differently in different settings. And it could adjust to some sort of local cultural um, also expectations. And so how that process went for uh, Bosnian Muslims and how they use this, um, this opening to essentially construct uh, uh, Bosnian Islam to serve as one of the uh, factors that helps development of that nationalism and development of, of a group in, into a full-fledged nation. Similarly, that happened to other Europeans when, you know, when universality of, of Christianity was broken after the Reformation, especially after the French Revolution, right? When, they, when Europeans start to conceive their own Christian sects as national religions, right? As separate religions. So same way, in a similar way, essentially things works in among Bosnian Muslims. And that was also a quite a new thing, which I have yet to read in any other works, how that theology can actually help development of nationalism for a group. And so all these things is in the book. I hope anybody, you know, uh, that people read it and anyone who has a questions, we can now discuss further, you know, things that are interesting to you out of the book. Because I could go on and on and on <laughs> about it. I guess I can uh, take the mic here. Thank you so much. I think it was an interesting talk. I think not only for uh, nationalism scholars here, but for listeners or future readers from other disciplines too. 
um, before letting our guests to um, ask their questions and um, write their comments, I would like to highlight uh, some points about the book for the future readers. I think, um, if, if, if that's okay with everyone, I think um, the significance of the book, this book comes from first as uh, Mr. Kriya Sorak emphasized too, it suggests a model to measure national identity as a bottom-up process. It is not very common in nationalism studies. Unlike many studies measure or demonstrate just like I did, national identities as a top-down processes like official nationalisms or nation building projects and so forth. Uh, this one focuses on bottom-up construction of a national identity with a field research and it is it, it sounds pretty difficult. Secondly, uh, the book's literature review, I think it's a very exceptional one. It is very wide and it can satisfy both political scientists and general readers wanting to learn more about the socio-historical background of Bosnian Muslims. Together with the notes, I think it was a really satisfying a reading a literature review and a theoretical background together with the notes and it fulfilled uh, my curiosity about Bosnian Muslims uh, socio historical background and I think um, the book is just like uh, Misat uh, told a minute ago it is important to show a case that reconciles religion and nationalism and finally I can say um, just to highlight, the book tries to voice uh, women's perspectives despite the difficulty of reaching out Muslim women in such field studies because I myself tried to and it was quite difficult to make them talk about themselves, their memories and um, their, uh, their perspectives about their identities and so forth. Um, now I think we can start QA session if that's okay with everyone. But um Yes. Yes, I was I was just uh, if you don't mind to to respond. Yeah, uh, that focus on the literature in the first chapter that you mentioned was precisely because I understood that uh, maybe there will be there some people may be contesting the proposal and the relationship between identity and nationalism. So that's why I actually did that intense and um, and comprehensive uh, view of the literature to point that actually most of these, how you say, seminal works on nationalism do talk about that relations. However, they were less explicit. So I was to establish essentially normalcy behind my proposal. Uh, I, I was actually to say that this have been there for a while however you know i'm actually able to test it to test it through a specific uh how you say research and hypothesis and then you know following the scientific method so that was that was what was uh, that's why i have done that extensive uh lit review in the first chapter for those of people who may be interested to read it was an exceptional one and it was really wide it was really comprehensive uh, i truly enjoyed reading it thank you um just a reminder once again um you can ask your questions by raising your hand if you don't have a chance to use your microphones you can easily type your questions and i can read here i think we have notification here no Until our guests uh, are ready with their comments or questions, maybe I can um, add something. Like, I, I want to ask a question. <laughs> so, um, just like I wrote in my review, um, although I believe bringing up women's identity question in a Muslim group is a courageous attempt, it was it should be really difficult. I see that uh, the gender-related hypothesis that takes place in your study um, is based on the emotions of women. Could you please give more detail 
about how. How did you get that point? Uh, at a first glance, this hypothesis looks like it's underestimating the women's distinct war and former Yugoslavia experience as a transitional period. But you said, well, you have seen uh, those distinct memories and experiences, but still this hypothesis looks the other way around. Could you please give more uh, details about it? Yes. Uh, so uh, to begin with, yeah, I, I think also it's good for people to see, you know, this is essentially a brief description of my data set, general description, so you can see, you know, who who the respondents were, right? And uh, uh, you can see that about 40% of the respondents were female, about 60% male. I also have encountered same like you, difficulty reaching out to male, uh, female, um, especially reaching out female alone, right? What was, was very hard, but I was persistent. I spent literally a month in each of these major cities or major centers where they are. This is essentially how they look like, you know, some images so you can see that they actually have visual representation of their identities. And so I was persistent in, in, uh, um, in trying to reach them out. So I would go to their uh, hair salons and sit there come for several days until they get used to me <laughs> and then uh, you know they will essentially in the end uh, feel more um, free to speak to me or essentially work with me right because I do look scary like when you see me you know, you're not sure right? um, but I did try very hard to reach people in the places where they go so I was like I said I would go to a party I would go to you know hair salon I would go to a restaurant and sometimes sit with people who, who are very drunk and, and discuss important questions, right? And then in the end, ask them, well, please, can you just fill up my form? <laughs> and uh, some of them will, some of them wouldn't. Yeah, so it was not an easy thing. But essentially, um, on some level, you are correct in your um, observation and your criticism that maybe that was not that, that, that this is not a full explanation of these differences between male and female, between genders, right? However, look, um, I have to be frank, right? And hopefully nobody gets upset with me. In all the literature that I read about uh, feminist uh, approach to this subject, you know, there is a lot of, um, how you say, a lot of criticism of existing studies a lot of observations of existing studies, but hardly anybody suggested, how do we actually approach these differences? And so uh, do again to the limitation, you already said it's 300 pages, actually it's about 200 and something pages of text. And then uh, in the end of the book, you have um, uh, appendix with all questionnaires, with uh, you know other things that are part of the book, bibliography and stuff. So, you know, I try to actually test the proposal that there is a difference. So now I, again, I have seen the difference. And when it comes to this emotional response, right, it was quite an interesting thing to see that I have divided nationalism into two essential aspects, the strength of nationalism the intensity, right, and the type of nationalism. So I measured both. I measured how people perceive their nationalism in terms of strength and in terms of type. And so it was interesting to see that women are very uh, much alike, like men when it comes to type of nationalism. They perceive it the same way. Slightly more women, more women than men, prefers ethnic nationalism, which is, I guess, related to that uh, Gertz approach the, where woman is the conduit between society and the child. So, you know, maybe women perceive that uh, role that usually women in a group have stronger than the men. But generally, when I tested the, the, the you know, chi square between the different, I mean, of these differences, they did not show to be significant. However, I'm just reporting that in general, more women were interested in ethnic than in civic type of nationalism. But when it comes to intensity, women also responded differently. So now I am opening the door for essentially examining nationalism different among different uh, uh, gender categories. 
because in my data, they responded differently. I have to tell you that I also have done about 80 interviews with individual members in, 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 um, in all these places, individual members, sometimes regular people, sometimes those identity promoters, and these are all recorded. So maybe some future book project will be essentially once I able to uh, to analyze all these interviews, right? To come up with a story. And then I also had a four focus groups where I have divided these focus groups again into gender, gender divided focus groups. So I had separate focus groups with women and separate focus groups with men. All these things is recorded. So I still have these recordings. And what I observe as I was working with this, I did observe that women are essentially responding to these diff things differently and oftentimes they are more emotional when it comes to this then i looked into the literature and literature does talk about it it talks about that women may be more emotional however they're more specific while the man is more abstract as i sometimes say, say to my students when i teach nationalism and i do address this difference you know men will die for a flag women will die for a child so now, you know, it's it's a different type of, uh, how do you say, commitment, right? Women are more specific while the man is more abstract, right? Um, however, that specific difference that women may experience is oftentimes, um, you know, some oftentimes emotionally expressed, right? However, I'm not saying that this is the only difference. I'm saying this is what I have measured to essentially test the proposal that women and men will respond differently. Because mm -hmm. like I said, I have read a lot about it, but I have yet to actually see somebody showing me that actually, you know, you can observe these differences by measuring. So what I did, I measured it, and now I have evidence that they responded differently. And now we can look into that further. I don't have any problem with that type of criticism that maybe I could have done it more, explore this further, but, you know, that will require maybe another book, right? Um, or another chapter where I can just address that differences. What I have done, as I said, this is exploratory study. I have shown that identity can be measured, that nationalism can be measured, especially ethnicity, I mean, especially type of nationalism and intensity of nationalism. I showed that data shows that responses to our type of nationalism, intensity of nationalism are different. So therefore, it, it it is warranted to separate those two things, right? How nationalism works. In the book, I also talk about nationalism being um, using different ways in different phases. So I have studied essentially, let's say classic nationalism. I do acknowledge there is that banal nationalism that works differently in everyday settings. And that's where I talk about essentially how identity is essentially measured, where identity can be measured in two aspects. It's, it's well described in the book. In two aspects, we don't measure identity as just adopting it or not, but we have phases. The first phase is that phase of self-defining, and second phase is phase of self-investing. And that I measure just that first phase what, you know, which is basically members of the group deciding to adopt the identity. And then after that, in that self-investment stage, they commit themselves to it and they essentially engage in those collective actions that, uh, you know, identity usually is needed for. So, um, as I said, your criticism is absolutely valid and accepted. Um, there could be said more about differences between gender. However, like I said, I have shown that there is a difference. And now we can look further into that and essentially understand what could what, what are the reasons for this difference, all the reasons. Is it just this or is it maybe something else? And so on and so forth. But like I said, um, all the literature I read is usually well-established criticism on the approach, but not much advice on how to actually measure it and how to actually observe these differences. I don't know whether this is satisfactory or not. While I was listening to you, it just pops on in my mind, like um, feminist perspective sees nationalism as a way towards a fraternity. So maybe that's why 
how this fraternity is ready for you know devoting themselves to abstract values but this difference is quite uh, i think astonishing because uh, it will open up new uh, ways to measure the differences between uh, genders and when it comes to national identity it's very interesting i think uh, your explanation makes pretty clear thank you um i think there are two messages here but i think um still not questions or comments um until again um our participants decide to contribute through a uh, chat box I can uh, well continue with uh, my own comments and questions to uh, you know maybe it kicks off another discussion. So um, while reading your book, I was thinking continuously how far we could take this research uh, to reflect the sense of national identity of Bosniaks in general. So basically, as you mentioned before. So it would have been uh, good to compare your data with different diasporas and homeland uh, identity perceptions as well. But based on your observations only, um, how far can we take this study in terms of its representative power? I'm asking how Bosnax today understands about their national identities, both uh, in diasporas and in, in, in homeland as well? Um, well, you know, it, I think uh, to the extent that I could compare my work with, uh, with some other data sets to understand the representativeness or um, to what extent it could be understood, um, could be used to reflect really on, on, on everything is, um, for example, I have uh, looked into religiosity of the group, right? Mm -hmm. And I uh, the, the religiosity factor in my data set is quite large. Um, and uh, some people may question it, right? However, when I looked at the, uh, at the census data, which was provided by the census done also in 2013, uh, 2013 at the same time when I collected my data set, right? The census data have shown that 90% of Bosnians, Bosniaks do identify themselves as, as believers. And uh, most of them also kind of uh, indeed have answered a question when it comes to religion as people who are praying. So therefore, um, um, therefore, um, um, it is in that sense, you know, representative of uh, maybe the perceptions of Bosniaks that Bosniaks have, have today. However, like I said, ideally, uh, this data set could be replicated, or rather, these questions could be rec replicated somewhat, uh, you know, maybe slightly reorganized, right? Replicated into these three settings. Why? Because I think the most serious problem with the observation I did was um, was that uh, uh, that it's just one point in time. We don't have that longitudinal depth, right? So that we can compare this with the previous, uh, how you say, uh, situation when it comes to that Bosnian identity. I did ask in the questionnaire, you know, to what extent they feel attachment to previous identity of Muslim. In former Yugoslavia, Muslim was a national identity. Um, and you can see that, that you know, you can see the data in the book. Uh, so in that way, I took into the account the previous identity versus the new one, or the previous name to identity versus the new one. However, um, 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 However, that longitudinal depth is missing. And so I was thinking, okay, how can that longitudinal depth be 
uh, addressed. And I realized that the best way, since Bosniaks have memory, they don't have a national history yet, they have memory, right? Um, um, that could be addressed by examining these different diaspora groups, which have established themselves in different times. And diasporas tend to, because I have looked into German diaspora in America, Irish diaspora in America, and other diasporas, you know, diasporas tend to freeze their perception of their groupness into the time when they come. Obviously, they change, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying, okay, so Germans who came here in, in you know, end of 19th century stay the same. No, absolutely not. They have changed, but they froze certain elements and ideas about that Germanness when they came here. So same way, I assume the Bosniaks also have frozen their notion of identity when they went to Turkey, right? Many of them went after 1878, right? And so they've been going there since uh, all the way into 60s, right? And so I think um, that group there have essentially froze certain ideas about that identity, uh, as well as then you have those 1970s uh, when Bosnians go to Germany, right? When Yugoslavia was in the full bloom and they have perceptions about, um, you know, Bosnian identity in that perspective. And then you have these modern or contemporary uh, a story of Bosniaks now in America because I have measured those who, who came to the United States. In fact, I have seen this when I went to Chicago, and the Chicago is one of the um, is the city with perhaps uh, oldest, well-organized Bosnian diasporas, right? Who have come to Chicago, according to some stories, even there were some Bosniaks who were basically on the on the ship on that uh, ship that sink. Um, what was the name of the big ship? I, my brain froze, right? So Bosniaks were coming to to uh, to United States and due to those chain migrations, they will usually go to the cities where they can find their compatriots so that they can somehow figure out the way to survive. They have come to the to Chicago ever since late 1800s and early 20th century, right? especially after the Ottoman Empire started to collapse after 1909, you know, some Bosnians came to the United States and they established themselves, most of them, most strongly, they established themselves in Chicago. And then you have also a group that have come here, you know, after World War II immediately, which were basically perhaps a group that have a memory of 1930s all the way into 1945. And then you have a group that came after 19. 70s, right, you, in Yugoslavia, and then you have the current group. And then I realized these four groups of Bosniaks are actually not necessarily interacting with each other the same way. They have a different understanding of each other based on the time when they came here and based on the projections they had at the time when they came here. And so that was quite, quite a fascinating thing for me. And so that's why I realized that that initial idea where you can measure these different uh, uh, diaspora groups based on the time period when they went into that, uh, how you say, diaspora, that actually can provide us with some sort of longitudinal depth in terms of how that identity is perceived over and across the time. Obviously, ideally, you could do it, you can replicate these studies, you know, several times, but, you know, <laughs> who has, you only can live, you, you have one lifetime, you know, and <laughs> it's very hard to, to do all that stuff. I think we have a question here in the chat box from Svetlusha. Svetlusha um, Srova, Miri's coordinator. So she says, thank you for a fascinating book presentation. It is great to see that you're examining nationalism and identity questions from below. Are you thinking doing the same research in Bosnia and Serbia in order to compare identities at home to those abroad? Thank you. I think it was somehow closer to what we were discussing too, so it's going to be complimentary, I guess. Yes, yes, and yes, and I think, and I'm hoping that uh, Miri will find a way for me to do it, right? Um, and um, that is essentially uh, one of the future goals, if I possibly can. I would love to replicate this. There is essentially already some conversation with some people in Turkey who may be interested may be interested to test it, to actually do the similar thing uh, among Bosnia and diaspora in Turkey, and then 
hopefully in the near future, I will be able to do this uh, um, in Bosnia and Sanjak, uh, which is basically nowadays Serbia and Montenegro, right? And see um, what type of results I will come with from that population. And then you know, it will be um, uh, to the extent that we can compare it since my measure is done in 2013. Right, so that we can compare what we get there with what we got here, and maybe, you know, what uh, if that researcher goes through with his um, suggestion, what we can find in Turkey. That will be quite quite a fascinating thing. Again, my suggestion is that all those people who study nationalism try to actually come up with a way to measure it, because there is a lot of talk, but very um, not enough. The research, not enough science behind things we do. Okay. I think we have another question. Uh, Alena Demirovic, uh, she asks, Professor Kriya have you included the Bosnian Canadian diaspora in your studies from Boston University School of Theology? No, unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, my major centers for for data uh, uh, gathering was uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, and New York. Among others, I also have gathered data from Lawrenceville, Lawrenceville in Georgia, from um, uh, Waterloo in Iowa, from Des Moines, Iowa, from Utica, New York, um, from... Um, um, uh, from a few other places, you know, along the way, uh, even from Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, right? But they have not gotten uh, data from Canada. Um, also, you have to know that when I was doing my research, I had certain limitation in terms of IRB. Uh, initially, I had a very strict IRB requirement where every participant was not only to agree to participate, but to sign the uh, IRB form where basically the person agrees with his signature or her signature to participate. So that IRB requirement was quite limiting in that first phase. Then later on toward the end of my research, um, to, toward the end of my data gathering, I asked the, the IRB to um, revise my IRB approval and just allow me to collect data from just a verbal um, uh, agreement, right? Because there's really nothing personal in these questionnaires. And only toward the end, they were, they gave me that permission, right? But I was already back, back to Miami. And so then uh, it was a quite, um, you know, I was able to collect a few more of those uh, um, uh, questionnaires after that, but majority of them was collected in that first phase where each participant had to sign the IRB form which made it much, much more harder for me to collect the data. You know, uh, there are also literature on that, how the post-communist societies have a hard time signing documents and especially, you know, agreeing to this type of um, uh, arrangements, right? And so I was many times during my research for those three months, three, some plus months, right? I have encountered that where people were willing to participate, they will be happy to do it and stuff maybe even get an interview. But once I ask them, okay, can you please sign the IRB, IRB form? They will then step back and say, no, no. Or can I do it without signing the IRB form? And I say, no, because you know I don't want to jeopardize my research. Even though I would love to hear from you, I would not like to, I don't want to jeopardize my research. And so you'll be surprised. We're talking about journalists. We're talking about diplomats. We're talking about quite well um, um, educated, and establish people reluctant to sign the IRB form so that they can be included in the research. Why I'm saying all these things? Because um, my IRB form was only limiting me to United States, so I could not include Canada. Uh, and maybe in the future, you know, I can maybe look into Canada, although I do expect, I don't expect that much of a difference when it comes to United States and Canada. I do expect difference when it comes to United States and maybe European settings, but Canada, I think it's pretty much the same, unless you maybe um, 
Elena, you may be thinking that that, that Canadian diaspora, Bosnian diaspora is very different. I think we have another note here from Nora. Uh, in your research, between which groups did you find the largest differences in strength or type of nationalism? Was it a significant find? Men versus women, young versus old, educated versus uneducated. Um. Well, that's a complicated question, but I recommend you read my book, right? Um, when it comes to uh, here, I, I'm going to share the, the that uh, finding. Yeah, when it comes to uh, uh, differences, right? Um, um, we can see, like here, that significant differences are, are find between the groups, uh, between the the age groups. However, I. I broke the age groups, I mean, the age category into three groups. So there were people who came here before, um, uh, during the Yugoslavia, there are people who came during the war and people who came after the war, right? And uh, uh, so that way um, I could actually make sense of their, their age differences, right? Because of the way I measured. And then I found that when it comes to nationalism strength, there is a difference between those flanks. So in other words, between that group that came earliest and the group that came latest, that means that actually the group that came latest have experienced, uh, how you say, nationalism the most. And so it was normal. It was accept, expected that they will respond most strongly. Um, when it comes to nationalism type, as you can see, they did. there was not much of a difference. Um, there was a difference also in terms of economic attachments, which I measured by asking people, do you still have a property back home, uh, real estate of some kind, right? And those who do tend to have um, tend to have a stronger, uh, how you say, sense of uh, nationalism than those who don't. And they that actually does affect, you know, uh, what type of identity they will choose. So it is not surprising that, you know, you have some policies nowadays back in Bosnia, which try to actually um, uh, try to change these conditions, right? Lots of people who own properties um, uh, who are in the diaspora may find it difficult to retain these properties due to the changes in law. And as you can see, these factors do play a role. Now, finally, when it comes to education, I found, maybe surprising or not, but I found that education is not a significant factor in uh, selecting a preferred salient identity based on the strength, neither based on the type. Uh, education, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, educated people tend to be more, how you say, pro-civic nationalism um, than uh, ethnic nationalism, which is, by the way, preferred nationalism for the whole group. Interestingly, Bosniaks prefer civic nationalism over the ethnic nationalism as a whole. However, difference was not significant between educated and non-educated people. And so, um, like I said, there, there are more details, in, especially in chapter six, and I hope you, um, you have time to look into it. Um, there's one more question. Well, I think Swet Lucia writes, um, there's a message for both both of us, and um, she asks a question first. I'm going to read her question, and I think uh, we will be done uh, in 15 minutes as planned. Okay. So she asks, uh, dear Mirsat, did you go back to your participants and shared with them your findings? If yes, what were, were their thoughts of it, and uh, what are your thoughts on co-production of knowledge with communities that you study as social scientists? Thank you. Um, well, um, no. I have to say to you, uh, I have not been able to share my findings with the participants. I did uh, um, as many as I possibly could of them. Um, I told them about the book that came and uh, that foundings are kind of in that book and stuff. But um, I have... Overall, I have not been able to share the findings with the participants 
again, it's, you know, I spent three months doing it uh, and uh, it will be quite difficult for me to actually go and revisit every, all these places. However, you know, I will be happy to do it if the opportunity comes, right? Um, and we'll see, you know, I was able to talk to some of these centers and, and show and share with them the findings, however, not not as widely as I would love to. Um, and uh, when it comes to production of knowledge, <laughs> yes, when it comes, I did, I did. That's uh, that's what I, I said, you know, I did let everybody know that the book is out and it has an open source link, uh, thanks to generous gift of, of University of Michigan Press. So it's accessible for free to everybody. I provided a link already. Right, so I did let them know about it, uh, but when it comes to production of knowledge, this is crucial. You know, um, I talk about it quite a lot. You know, Foucault talks about it. You know, in his work sometimes about that whole you know uh, exercise of power when it comes to producing knowledge. Right, what knowledge is being produced and what knowledge is not being produced, and I mentioned in in that first uh, part of our conversation. That this is the first book on this topic. So all of you may be aware that just a few days ago, you know, there was um, the whole discussion about, you know, Bosnian war. It still is not settled. It's still um, not well understood. It's still not agreed upon um, between the people in that region and even wider how to perceive that war, right? And especially that sticking point of, Srebrenica genocide, right, which was ruled to be a genocide by international uh, by international tribunal for former Yugoslavia, established by the Security Council, right. But this is still contested, and so I understand the fact that there is no work on Bosnian Muslims and Bosniaks yet from that perspective. I think that's essentially a result of exercise of power, or rather, their lack of power to actually produce. Um, knowledge and work about themselves um, as, as, as a group, right? And I mentioned that there is yet to be established something which we will refer to as a national history. But don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean that there are no books or no works about history of Bosniaks and history of Bosnian Muslims, but, you know, not something that, you know, other groups in that region enjoy. So all these things is a matter of... Um, exercise of power in terms of producing knowledge and what knowledge will be produced and what knowledge would not be produced. We now all witnessing in the world, you know, how this exercise of power in terms of production of knowledge is going. And it is quite shocking for many of us academics to see that the intentionality, you know, so blatant intentionality behind the production of knowledge to justify this or that, right? So uh, very much part of the whole story and in, in, and also very much uh, part of the reason why I essentially in the end did decide to study Bosnian Muslims and not some other groups which I was tempted to look into because you know sometimes you want to look into um, um, something you don't know so that you can enrich yourself. But I said, okay, um, because of this factor of power exercise in terms of producing knowledge, I decided to focus on this group, which I understand perhaps well due to what we call it theoretical sensitivity or being the part of that, how you say, setting. Although I have to say that I am coming from all over former Yugoslavia. So, you know, I have, <laughs> I have uh, uh, roots in the different communities and uh, uh, I have, um, I, I I cannot uh, say that I'm from one place only. I grew up uh, in Belgrade. I was born in Kosovo. My parents are from Sanjak. Um, my wife is from Bosnia, right? So I'm from all over that region, and I have some sort of sensitivity toward all these groups. I have cousins and friends in each one of them, but I do understand um, uh, how you say, I do understand that element of exercise of power when it comes to producing knowledge and 
once the knowledge is produced, which knowledge will be widely used and which one will not be used and so on and so forth. But thank you for that question. Do we have any other questions from our participants? If no, I think we can get ready for wrapping up. No hands raised. So, okay. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for participating and satisfying answers. And um, I think uh, we had a really beneficial book talk. It's satisfied in terms of information, it's satisfied in, in terms of academic talk. And also, uh, we try to introduce a first nationalism and then identity. And I think uh, it this book talk could uh, boost curiosity about this uh, topic. So um, I think this book offers an interesting model, just like we talked a lot about for analysis of national identities with parameters like nationalism type and nationalism strength. So I think these parameters will be applied in many uh, studies that aim to uh, measure national identity. And I think it will hold a significant place in nationalism literature to offer new insights for future research and will be a source for general readers as well who wants to learn more about nationalism and Bosniak identity in general. So I would like to thank uh, me again to Miri for organizing this event and hopefully we can get together in future events like this again. Um, yes, and hopefully we will be able maybe in the future to talk about your research as well. Hopefully, think, in short know, future. Vaccine nationalism is still uh, you know, in the minds of many. Yeah, I'm also interested in the intersection points of biopolitics and nationalism, like racism, eugenics, and how nationalism can differentiate itself from racism and uh, how it f can find a place in nation uh, building processes and so forth. So yeah, that's, um, that's what uh, uh, our director, Dr. Surova, have also implicitly studies how that uh, whole bio-nationalism works on the Roma population in Slovakia and throughout the whole that Central Europe. Now, it's quite a fascinating story for those of people who are interested in it. You should read. Pleasure meeting uh, Svet Lucia Sorova and uh, pleasure uh, meeting Miri and um, moderating this event under the umbrella of Miri. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.